Hi, I'm Diane Hullett. Welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. Today, I've got a really interesting speaker that we've not heard from before, Suzanne O'Brien. Suzanne is a hospice nurse, an RN, a best-selling author, an internationally acclaimed speaker and trainer. She's the founder and CEO of the Doula Givers Institute. And I think she's got some really interesting things to share about hospice, caregiving, and all of our roles. So welcome, Suzanne. So good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Well, let's, gosh, we've just, we've been chatting as we, before we hit the record button, and I think we're just bubbling over with things to discuss, but, you know, start out by just give us a little Suzanne O'Brien background. How did you get into this work and when did you start the Doula Givers Institute? Sure. Well, I am a registered nurse by trade, and I've worked most of my nursing career in hospice, which is end-of-life care, and oncology, which is cancer care. And that was my my purpose and my passion. I knew right when I was in that space that I had found it, why I'm here, what I need to do. And unfortunately, most end of lives, I have to say this from my experience, are not going well. And really trying to identify what's happening here, what are the gaps, like what's missing and what can we do to change that? Because we only have one opportunity to have that go well. And so I remember, you know, and I was literally just talking about this running all over my county as a hospice nurse in my Honda Civic, trusted Honda Civic, after hours, not being paid, trying to be with those families because I knew every time I was present there, their stress would go down and every time I left uh, the stress would go up. And as a hospice nurse, I was only there for one hour once a week. I mean, it cr it's crazy to say that. And the model of hospice is that I'm supposed to, as the hospice nurse, teach the loved ones how to do that care. 98% of the actual care is done by the family. Well, right now we have a perfect storm of death is the number one fear. People treat death like it's optional. We don't plan on it. We don't talk about it. Um, and then when it shows up, which inevitably, Diane, it will one day, it's a train wreck. It's a crisis. And so I finally, from all of that, came up with, wait a minute, if we're supposed to teach the loved ones how to do the care and fears in front of them and people come on hospice very late, why don't I take all my knowledge and put it in a comprehensive training, identify the three phases, it's called the doula givers model of end of life, and the interventions to use in each one of those phases, and then infuse it with bedside stories. And I went to my CEO of hospice, I knocked on the door, I'd never talked to him before, he just kind of walked the hallways. And I, he said, come in. And I said, I have this idea. It's not going well for families. Here's a training. He said, this is great. He said, we can't use it. I said, why? He goes, we won't get paid for it. We won't get reimbursed for it. So I said, well, how much is the reimbursement? I was just curious what, why this was being held up. It was like $166 a day. And I said, oh, I'll go teach it at the library for free. And all of a sudden news picked it up and then I put it online and people from all over the world would take it. And to this day, which is almost 18 years later, this training is still attended and I do it live and I answer questions by thousands of people from around the world to teach families again, that skill of how to care for somebody at the end of life. So it led me on. I never, I never knew what was happening, Diane. I just always was like, how do we show up? It started as family caregiver. In those trainings, people said, I could do this. I could be a doula for the end of life. I was like, yes, let's go. In 2012, I went to Zimbabwe, Africa to volunteer as a hospice nurse. They taught me about the power of the presence, really being the best medicine we have for one another. And I came back and I just, you know, kept talking about that, promoting it. And here we are. And now we're on the verge again of bringing death back as a human experience, not a medical one. And that's going to change the entire end of life scope. You know, part of what I love about your story, Suzanne, is it's like you really, it's really grounded in the medical and then it really transcends the medical. And then it's really grounded in your personal experience with families as a nurse. And then you really said, how does this go bigger? And, and you've taken it bigger, both in terms of training doulas who are then mm -hmm. professionals. And I think we'll talk more about like, where are, where is that headed as a profession? And then mm -hmm. also you've taken it on for how do I impact family caregivers? Givers. And that seems like what you're really passionate about right now. I, I love yeah. these questions. Suzanne's got a wonderful newsletter. Doula Givers has a great newsletter. And uh, the, her recent newsletter said these questions. What if I told you the greatest determining factor in whether or not an end of life journey is considered positive is the level of support experienced throughout the process? So true. 
Number two, you said, would you agree that there is always room for more support in that scenario, or would you just settle for the bare minimum? And then you asked, when considering your own end of life or that of a loved one, would you want as much support as possible or would you rather face it alone? And I think when people really look at this, come to terms with it, believe that their loved one or themselves are going to be facing it, we all want more support. And I think this is what we're sorely lacking. Yes, I agree. I agree so much. I mean, I, we could go on and on about this, but it is so critically important to step into this conversation because each and every one of us will be called one day to be with somebody at the end of life. And the more empowered we are with resources and understanding and knowledge, that can be one of the most beautiful parts of a life's journey because it used to be, death used to be revered as a sacred rite of passage just like birth and, and marriage and those things. And we've really removed all of that support and learning. So right now it's, and when I say it's a thousand times harder, I'm being very, uh, I'm being very light on that. And we only have the one opportunity to do it. And when we know that it can go well with certain factors, why aren't we sharing that? Well, we are at Do the Givers Institute and you with the conversation and your beautiful work you do. Yeah, I think that we really share that passion for if only people understood how this, yes, it's about death, but just death is the final step in the journey. And as Barbara Karn says, you know, you're living until you're dead. There's really, it's really not so much about dying. It's about living right up until the very end of this yeah. life on this, on this earth. So what, you know, how do you tackle this? Like, what are some of the angles that you come at this in the work you do? Yeah, great question. So I honestly will look at what is the need, what is happening. And I have to say that we have such a beautiful community and people every day, and it breaks my heart because every day I get messages and emails from families who talk about an end of life that was tragic and traumatic and didn't go well. And they wish they knew this beforehand and if only. And I'm like, okay, so our beautiful doula giver practitioners are absolutely amazing. And when people say, well, our healthcare system is breaking down, which it is, and me, and I can speak this way, we have heroes in that system. They're set up, it's virtually impossible for them to do what they wanted to do when they came into that because they have so many patients and so little time. So the doula giver practitioners are wonderful, but even if our institute and there's other great institutes put out a thousand a year, is that going to really match what the need is? And so listening to my families and saying what was happening and then really cementing the fact that 98% of the hands-on care is done by family caregivers and hospice is the end of life provider, which is a beautiful model, is supposed to teach them. And there's the gap. It's not working. There's not enough time. Fear is there. They're coming on processes late. Let's get right to the family caregiver. What can we do to support them? What do they need? How can we provide it? And how can we make that shift for them? So I feel like, again, it's a multi-tiered transition that we need to make, no pun intended, transition the word. However, to change end of life, but it really is. And right now, families have one opportunity to have this go well. They're, they're the ones that are doing it and we need to show up for them. Say more about this 98%. What, what, where does that statistic come from? Medicare. So Medicare did a recent study and they found that 2%, uh, they found out with their study that 30 on average, 30 minutes a day um, by a hospice, some hospice worker, because you know, you have an aide one day, a social worker, um, a nurse at once a week. Uh, on the average, only 30 minutes a day is a hospice worker in the home of an end of life patient that came to 98%. And I have to tell you that, I was there as that hospice nurse and it's terrible. And one of the things I think, Diane, that's so important about talking about this before we get there is that people don't wanna talk about death for the most part, which again, we need to uncover what that's about. Um, but when they find out the reality of what hospice does and what they don't do, they're in it. And when they didn't realize that I wasn't there every day and that they needed adjunct support or whatever it may be, it was another huge blow to this already traumatic experience. That's not the time that you want to find out what resources you actually have and what you need to be filling in. Right. Definitely a, a theme I've been hearing and bringing forward with guests is this idea of getting on hospice sooner simply means... Oh to have the care of the team. And, and I think the people who are most unhappy with their hospice care experience are often people who are on, 
you know, with hospice for one to two to three weeks and the team wasn't in place and the support wasn't there and nobody had been trained and it all just happened so fast that nobody kind of could catch their breath. So I'm always saying to people, wouldn't you want to investigate the hospices in your area long before you need them? Just kind of have your ear to the ground. What do you hear? What are the rumors? What have friends liked? So that you have an idea of who you might call for you or for your loved one. And then Call them before you think you need them. Call them when things are starting to be a little questionable. Maybe you don't even qualify yet, but you can find out what they offer and you can begin to see what that support system is. And as you're saying, the gap in the support system is that they are not there all the time. And in fact- as you said, you know, maybe some days they're there for four hours, maybe some days someone is there for two hours, but on average, they're there 30 minutes a day, leaving families caregiving the vast majority of the time. And we're very unprepared for this. Also, can we throw in here? What do you know the statistics on? I bet that is mostly women doing the caregiving. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. So that's a really good point. So on average, it's about the age of a woman is 50, 50 50.1 that's doing the caregiving. And it's usually the woman. And look, here's the thing that I want to say is that we've been dying for thousands of years. You know, we know how to do this. It's the last hundred that we completely turn this into a medical experience and it's not. And by doing so, we became into a very dangerous place because we tell doctors, fix it. And it's not, death is not to be fixed, right? It's to be supported. It's to be a natural occurrence. And when we start tinkering and doing things, we almost can create a lot more suffering. Um, This is a natural thing. And like you said, not only find out about your hospice, but plan ahead. Where do I want to be? So nine out of 10 people poll said that they want to be at home at at terminally. I'm yeah, sign me up. Right. What does the caregiver need to feel confident and supported to make that happen? Because when you are and when you know what gaps you need to fill and what education you can learn ahead of time or any of that, um, I tell you this, it goes 80 to 90% better no matter what the disease process. That's a win. That's a win across the board for me for something 100% guaranteed. I, I love that, right? Something with 100% guarantee, if you can improve it from being a train wreck to being something that actually makes space for kind of the mystery and the magic and the wonder of this transition, Absolutely. Not, not to be all pie in the sky. It's, um, you know, I, I, I know there's, it's terribly sad and terribly yes. difficult, but I think we heap a whole lot of difficult on top of it that wouldn't have to be there. And so, so talk a little, you're, you're really talking about Tula Giver's that have that funny you're really talking about doula givers training in two different ways one is yeah. training doulas and one is training caregivers say yeah. it's just a snippet of how you train what you offer in your caregiver training and then let's sure. turn to the doula piece perfect so we recently changed our tracks because based on again what we're getting response from so many people have taken our level one family caregiver training and they loved it. And they said, well, I don't want to be a professional doula giver, but I want more of that. I want more training. And we we're like, okay, absolutely. We know to get to the caregiver. So we've, we've really divided this into two very different distinct tracks. We now don't offer the standalone certified end of life doula training. And I'll tell you why. There are wonderful trainings out there, and this is a global movement, but with any movement comes a lot of flutter, and there's a lot of things happening. This is not a government licensure, the death doula, and because of that, good news and not good news. So you can have death doula training A, B, and C all titled the same and completely different, and this is causing damage to the reputation of a death doula because when a doula has extensive training, which is wonderful, and walks through and takes care of a family and the doctor hears about the response of that, they expect that that's what death doulas are going to provide. But different trainings offer very different things. And that's okay in one sense, but it's also confusing uh, people out there and we want to be careful. So what we wanted, what we did was we took the certified end-of-life doula, which is three different levels and it has a wealth of information and really took it and tailored the whole thing towards the family caregiver. So teaching end-of-life disease processes, the pre-planning, which we've made our own advanced directive, nine choices that really have to be thought 
to have that positive, not only end of life, but where would you want to be? Who do you want to do the care? What about after death celebrations? So pre, during the three phases and all of the medications and just talking about those practical things. And then also what I call dying to be green, the after choices of funerals and living wakes and first person eulogies and how you can actually have an end of life with a cremation for less than $100. Yes, there are ways, not easy, but people need to know these. So that you can almost think of it as the certified end of life doula training, but now it's for family caregivers, no certification, no testing, which is great. The second track is what's the doula giver uh, practitioner. So that is our, and it's a full spectrum now, elder care training, end of life doula, care consultant, grief, and legacy doula. So that we know when we have that title as a doula giver practitioner, people know what they're getting when you walk through the door. Yeah. Fantastic. And I love how you've kind of broken it out because there is the professional track and then there is the layperson caregiver who just wants to yes. be more so they can make this better. You, you know, 18 years, 18 plus years in this, you've seen a lot of changes in this global movement. What, what kind of generalizations would you make about what you see happening? Where do you see this going? What are people who go through your training coming out and doing? So what I love so much is the teachings that death provides us. It's our greatest teacher about humanity and how we're all connected and we're so much more similar. And again, I really credit being in Zimbabwe with that hospice team from Island Hospice, taking me out, working in huts and showing me, they didn't have the medications and the equipment that we have, showing me the power of the presence. And they were taking a, a, somebody from the neighboring hut and teaching them to sit like a doula. And just knowing the physiology, what really, a couple of things that really surprised me about the online training that we get people from all over the world for years is how Western medicine has really infiltrated um, into many places in the world in extending life. And this fear of death, for whatever reason, has really become, it's the number one in the world. And it's in places, you know, I have people in Uganda and I have people in Ukraine and I have people that come to this training and talk about the same thing about their communities and not talking about end of life, not having the support and facing an, an aging population. So what I wanna say is this, how we make this shift and what's so exciting is literally by perspective. That's the first step is remembering that death is not a medical experience. It is a human one and a holistic one and it can go really well. So that's the, I even say this to doctors and they go, Oh, oh yeah, wait a minute. And so if we can get that reality back in, then we start saying, okay, so it's a human holistic skill. And these are the things that we found that support families and support patients and, and from a practical standpoint, but what about the stories and what about what people want to share at the end of life that completely take this and change your whole view of end of life? Like the very common things about, yeah, people seeing their loved ones at the end of life. Like there are very common practical things that really open up a much bigger picture here. I love that. That's such a great big picture on it. Big picture perspective on it. Mm. I, I love, I recently saw um, Dr. Sarah Kerr, who's a doula and educator in Canada, had mm. a fabulous um, little short the other day. And the quote that I love from it was that she said, you know, we can come to death and we can have unconditional cooperation with the unavoidable. And I thought <laughs> it was such a great phrase. You know, because that's it is really good. Is. And she said, you know, what if you thought of this as like two diplomats shaking hands? You don't yeah. have to like death. You don't have to be excited about it or looking forward to it, but it is an unavoidable thing that you are having to cooperate with. So I, I think that's I love that, Diane. That is, is like, how does that go? How does that take it to this bigger level where we sink into the acceptance and yes. we be with it? And I think that's what you're talking about when you talk about the Yes. The presence that you were being um, shown in this, in the huts was this sense of humanity. Oh, with just compassion and holding the space and presence and knowing this is a natural experience, not just for the person that was dying, but for all those loved ones as well. And, you know, when you think about it, because oftentimes I said, where did this fear come from? And this fear is palpable. Yeah. You see people do things that you, you are just, you know, 
it's horrifying at times and everyone is just so scared. And I think it's it's a combination. I love what Sarah Kerr just said, but think about the terminology we use in the medical profession. I'm sorry, there's no more I can do for you. Um, he lost his battle with cancer. When did death become the ultimate enemy? And have we set this up? in a way that we have created this fear of this on many levels. So we really need to just look at this for the truth of it and say, okay, we need to start rewriting the script. And it starts with you and me, not as educators, that's really important, but as people to decide what quality of life is to me ahead of time. And when would I not want to pursue aggressive treatment? Where would I want to be? What would make that possible for my family to do that really well? Because I've had hospice patients who said, look what I'm doing to my family. Like they're dying in the bed and they feel guilty at the stress there. And I, they're not wrong, the pressure that they're under because there's not resources and support. So you, we have to change this on many, and we have to let doctors off the hook. Because first of all, there's so much they can do for somebody at the end of life with symptom management and holding that space. We need to rewrite the script here, the chapters, the book, the ending. Yeah, so that our understanding of it can change and that we can do it better. I just think there's something about um, going into it with such fear for everyone involved and hoping it won't happen that I, I just find kind of astounding that we're so what are we? Are we just so immersed in our uh, yeah. busy slash productive slash Western white dominant culture that thinks it all has to have it all together and be moving forward and that somehow we've created death as the ultimate thing to avoid? Um, yeah, we've, and, give, we've given it away. We've outsourced it and we've outsourced our elderly and I'm not here to judge and, and put judgment on anything. But I think if we want to see where we need to make change, we've got to know where we were, where we are and what we can do to move forward. And if you think about, you know, we kind of discard our elderly in these homes and states and we don't see that aging process. We don't think they have value because yeah, they don't have all the answers or they're not, they actually have many answers. They're not as fast moving and, and things of that nature. Um, and I think we just have to pause and say, we, we've done something wrong here and we need to take this back. So we've, but we've given our elderly and our end of life away and so then when it's there, we it's just a train wreck and it doesn't go well. I've had doctors call me up and doula givers, doctors call me and say, you need to help us. We're intubating people. The families are demanding that and, and the hospital's standing behind them. Like this is this is not going well. And, and you know what? And it really can go well. And I want to share that. Death can really go well with the right support and education. So why wouldn't we? I think when it goes well, it brings people together instead of tearing people apart. And I think there's a sense of wholeness and closure instead of a rupture. And again, not that it isn't terribly, terribly sad and terribly, terribly heartbreaking yeah. and grief filled. We haven't even really touched yeah. on grief, but, yeah. but it doesn't have to be uh, the enemy. Yeah. So no. And I'll tell you what, can I just say, cause I want to expand on that for a minute. So at the end of life, when it does show up, when the fear is so palpable and it's a fight or flight for the family caregivers, you're, you're they're in their home. They don't know how to do this, but you're saying, you know, care for your loved one. They're dying, you know, and good luck. They miss out on this sacred time with their loved one because they're in such panic mode. These are the moments of final conversations for, I love you's for thank yous for forgiveness for that, you know, just what you said. And when people aren't grounded in their bodies, they can't have that. They can't have that. So on multiple levels, we need to, we need to be changing the face of this. Yeah. Tell me more about your training that's about elder care doula. I'm intrigued by that because I, I was thinking the other day and I put up something on Instagram about this. You know, I've, I've got friends in these kind of protracted caregiving situations. Yeah. Yeah. Parents, the parents are not terminal. It is not time for that last beautiful moment together or whatever, um, mm -hmm. but they're just in it and it's really, yeah. hard, and there's no end in sight. And the adult children are working and trying to manage mom and dad aging. And uh, wow, I watched this happening. And because we're so fragmented and many of us live in different parts of the country, it's really something yeah. to see. Yeah. So let me share with that. So everything really with doula givers was organically built out of need. So there was this one time in New York City where I was called into Sloan Kettering, that's a cancer hospital, 
we're sending somebody home. They need a doula giver. They're going on hospice. I was like, great. I walked in for the consult through the hospital door room. Him and his wife were there. And I literally said to myself, he's dying. Like you could tell this man was like really sick. He was in his, I think late sixties. Um, and I explained what I did and they said, oh, that is so great what you do. We just don't need you yet. Cause they couldn't get past the death thing. They couldn't get past the end of life. And I was like, they, and I knew that they were going home alone and not okay, but you have to meet people where they are. And I was like, they needed me weeks ago, months ago. Um, but if I had an elder care support, if I had something that didn't have that death tag on it, they would have taken me home. And of course they called me Wednesday, he died on Sunday. But this is what I wanna say is that we have an aging population that we have never seen before in history, Diane. We have 78, and just in the US alone, we have 78 million people over the age of 65. 20% of them, 20% don't have their own children. It's usually adult children that will care for the dying parent or aging. Not always, by the way, for multiple reasons, but just in that whole staggering statistic, who's gonna care for them? So we know that this aging, I always say good news, bad news, we're aging so like the average age of life is 80 now and it used to be 46 100 years ago with that advanced age usually comes physical limitations cognitive limitations financial limitations or all of the above so there are these beautiful elder people that are deserving of holistic good care that are not end of life yet but we need to support we need to bring back that reality and it can be for decades so elder care doula and then i have some doulas who say they never get an end of life client they're always there and their elder care that they just step into the end of life role, which is beautiful. But I think again, bringing back with no judgment, the awareness that we need to do a much better job of caring for our elderly um, and holistically, holistically. And I think it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning. Some of this is, is just, um, how do I say it? Almost like facing what is coming on a practical level before you need to face it. So do you, uh, are you getting an early diagnosis of dementia? Do you have a history of Alzheimer's in your family? I, are you on your third round of cancer? What, you know, is a, is a heart attack typical in your family? What's, what are you kind of looking at and how do you face it so that you're doing some planning and some thinking ahead of time? And maybe that means helping somebody in your family take a training like this, or maybe that means helping someone in your family read a book that they found difficult to read or watch a movie, some way to open the conversation yes. Yes. so yes. That, that this these conversations are being had. How are we going to take care of Uncle Ed who has no yes. children? What's the what's the right. plan for we cousins? Um one lives right. in life, one doesn't. Like it's just so ripe for family conflict and difficulty, but it's also yes. ripe for cooperation. Yes. And here's the thing you will never regret caring for your loved one. You don't want to start figuring it out when it's happening. You want to do what you, because these are not easy answers sometimes, right? Who is taking care of Uncle Ned? Well, I never really got along with him, you know? Well, he's really grown. Well, we have, you know, the room, or you can put a granny pod in the back of the house. But I want to tell you a cool story. There is an 88-year-old woman who used to come to my death cafes, and she hired me to teach her children, her adult children who are in their 50s, the whole certified end of life doula, like we have this family tribe. She wasn't sick, but she was so progressive and great. And she wanted them to feel supported. And CBS News did, did a piece on that because it was wonderful. And the daughter was like, yeah, I get it. Mom wants to be home. And she wanted to make sure that we were supported in knowing how to care for her confidently. And this training was amazing. But the woman initiated that. That is that is everything. Yeah, that is, that is so cool. And then so cool. the people who can't initiate it don't remember that they need to initiate it. And the caregivers are still stuck. So, and it always strikes me too, this comes down, so much of it comes down to economics, right? I feel like families yeah. that can afford to hire some help or can afford to pay a family member for some help or have the means to contribute to Uncle Ed's care, yeah. you know, that's yeah. always going to make a difference. And with that difference. piece, I, I don't know, you know, it's building communities, I guess. It's building communities. You know, I just did a, a study, a, well, a podcast. It's it's something we did. And it's the seven steps to bringing death back to a holistic human experience. And, and one of the last things is, is to build doula houses and doula communities. And why do I say that? So that we can care for one another in these set, settings that have different tiers of acuity, so to speak. So if there's a woman that doesn't have children, oh, we're checking on her. You know, if she needs to have a community meal, whatever it is, like, like this, 
this is what can be done. And you really, I think, used to be done in the world and it needs to be done again. And it needs to be done globally, globally. Yeah. I love this, Suzanne. Well, you, your brain and my brain are just like popping, going up <laughs> to the stars and back to the weeds. <laughs> I love it. The big picture yeah. thoughts and then the like tiny little concrete things. But um, I think it's really an important conversation. And I always think, you know, if these conversations on this podcast can inspire a conversation at home, that's mm -hmm. the point. That's really the whole point. Yeah. And I also just you, two things like planning ahead for you and I, not as educators and sharing that with our loved ones and our medical provider, but our loved ones, what, what we would want or not want is one of the greatest gifts you can give them because as difficult as it is for them to say goodbye to us in this physical body, it is so much easier when the choices are already made, when the choice is already made. So give that gift to your family. Yes. So well said. Well, I thank you so much, Suzanne, for your time. You are hopping around on Zoom and in person all over the place doing amazing trainings. And I think we're just lucky to have you. Well, Diane, right back to you. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I learned so much from you and I'm inspired and let's continue to do what we do. Yeah, let's talk again. Let's see, let's yeah. check in like a year and see. You yeah, know, and accountability. accountability. Yeah. And who's gone through these family trainings? I think it's fabulous. You can find out more about the work of doula givers at doulagivers.com. And of course, you can find out about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. You've been listening to the Best Life, Best Death podcast, and I'm Diane Hullett. Thanks for my guest today, Suzanne O'Brien. Thank you, everybody. So Suzanne O'Brien and I were just talking further and we were talking about grief. You know, there's, it, everything is so loaded with grief these days, I find from, well, let's not get started on what, but all kinds of things are loaded with grief for people personally and at the broader global levels. What, how do you think we should cope with that, Suzanne? I love that th we're discussing this topic because grief is a huge topic right now and complicated grief, traumatic grief people are suffering from. How we solve grief being so heavy is bringing back death being that natural experience, understanding what it's like. Because when we are thrust into an end of life experience with, you know, for the first time with somebody we love without any background and it doesn't go well, of course, we're going to have this massive grief, regret. And if we dial it all the way back and bring back the truth about end of life, the empowerment about how to care for somebody, the communal and, and family oriented grief care, I mean, death care again, you're going to see that the grief is, is going to be a grief and bereavement, but it's going to be a very healthy, more of a healthy aligned one. It's not going to be this complicated, traumatic, stuck grief. In fact, one of our doulas, and this was so amazing. She was caring for this man. She was going through the certification training. He was in his eighties. And she told him about this one moment about uh, what she was learning about how people will oftentimes wait for you to actually step out of the room or away from the bed for them to have their end of life. And you're talking about people in their coma. She turned around, he was crying. And she said, why are you crying? And he said, you just gave me the greatest gift. She said, he said, for 35 years, I've been holding on that I was not present with my mother when she died. And now you're telling me that was all meant. Like, we need to talk about this. We need and to empower talk about this. That we is need such, to talk about it. It's such a good example of how a little bit of information makes a huge difference. I remember I was talking with hospice nurse Penny, who's a, you know, Instagram, TikTok kind of person. And she said that she put up a little tiny snippet about water, about how people stop drinking at the end of life. And this man contacted her and said, I had no idea for years and years. I thought that same thing. I thought that my family member had died of dehydration because I didn't keep their mouth moist and give them water to drink. And you just freed me from this guilt. So the things, these simple yeah. things that we don't know can cause, as you said, this complicated grief. And I, I, I agree with you. I think grief is inevitable and grief is uh, one of the bigger kind of human emotions, but it's gotten so muddied and so late. Oh, and people think that there's, that they can't move it. They're stuck in it because we don't have any containers. We don't have any teachings. One of the things that was surprising about the level one family caregiver training is how many people came to that and said they healed grief. I mean, people from 40 years ago, her parents, she said she's been through uh, counseling and programs and it's because they heard about the truth about it. Somehow they were able to find closure in that training, even 30, 40 years after, like this is everything because 
people are holding on to that pain every single day. Why? Wow. And I think again, Barbara Carnes, right? Knowledge reduces yes. fear. I think she could make a new sweatshirt that says knowledge reduces grief. I mean, that's really real. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Thanks, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you.